Hey everybody, it's Kat and Steve with the Positively Midwest Podcast. Before we get started, we're going to help pay some bills. We have hooked up with Anchor.fm to help us keep launching Positively Midwest to as many ears as possible. The more we expand our reach, the more lives we can help inspire. If you haven't heard of Anchor, it is the easiest way to make a podcast, and it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, and many, many more. You can make money with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchorapp.fm to get started. Now, sit back and enjoy the next episode of Positively Midwest Podcast. Hey everybody and welcome to Positively Midwest. We are on episode 47 and across from me as always is my beautiful wife Catherine. Hi and across from me is my husband Steve. Yeah and tonight we have a very special guest. We have Shane Balkowicz with us and uh, he's going to tell us about his book uh, Northern Plains Native Americans, a modern wet plate perspective and what wet plate photography really is. And all sorts of really good information. We're going to break down some barriers. Shane, you want to tell everybody hi? Hello. Uh, thanks for having me on the show, Steve and Catherine. You bet. Definitely. We are super excited and honored. Uh, you sent us a great book that we just mentioned, and there are some amazing photos in there, and it's something I've never heard of in my entire life. So and a big shout-out to Kat Perkins for um, connecting us, if you will. She's been a great support for us and, and a beautiful human being. Yes, absolutely. Woohoo, cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Shane, tell us a bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, what you do, um, anything you feel good about in your life, and explain to us just what the heck is wet plate photography. Sure. Um, I am a wet plate collodion photographer. I was born and raised, I should tell your listeners, uh, here at Bismarck, North Dakota in 1969. So, this is my, um, I, I am from North Dakota, born here in Bismarck. I I did uh, take a little um, ten-year um, journey to California. A day after graduating from high school, I packed everything that I owned up in my little '61 Volkswagen and drove to California for almost a decade. But then I ended up coming back, and um, I became a nurse. I came back and became a nurse, and then I became an entrepreneur. Um, I founded uh, a dot com in 1998 with my mother Sharon, um, and uh, we've been in business for 20 some years now. And then in the um, over that journey of, you know, being a CEO and, and the stresses of, of uh, you know, running a company and an online company is very difficult. It's a very daunting task. Things change very quickly. Um, I was looking for something um, positive or, or something. I was looking for something different in my life, something um, that I could uh, take my mind off my, uh, my corporate life. And I, I fell into this uh, photographic process that um, was invented by Frederick Scott Archer, um, he started working on it about 1848. He, he wrote, um, it was in a journal entry in a science journal uh, called The Chemist in 1851, and he introduced this type of photography to the world. So um, for your listeners, this type of photography, so you, you have to go back to Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln had his website taken um, back in the day. So uh, it's it's there's, there's a lot of different photographic processes, some more obscure, but there was the daguerreotypes in about 1838. Um, and then about 10, 12 years later, the, the wet plate came around. And when, when this type of photography came around, it was uh, revolutionary. It was, um, people were able to get their pictures taken for the first time. And uh, it really uh, changed, uh, changed humanity forever from that point. So all photographic processes, that digital camera that's on your phone, um, that is uh, a, um, a result of uh, what Frederick Scott Archer did, and, um, you know, 165 years ago. Wow, that's just amazing that even way back then somebody can figure something like that out. But, you know, one thing that stuck out to me, uh, Shane, was you uh, you said you have a dot-com company and, and you're doing a great job. It's kind of, a, you know, you wanted to get away from the corporate vibes a bit. And so recently uh, on our group we've been talking a little bit about like fulfilled, you know, like you maybe start a new job and you start um, doing really well and then it just becomes, you know, a job. It's, you're not like as challenged anymore. Is that kind of, um, has this piece of the pie kind of made you feel a bit more fulfilled then? Well, I think once people, um, 
get uh, a certain degree of wealth or or they feel comfortable in their lives or they get to that point. Um, I I can only speak for myself. I mean, I I just started wondering what's the, what's this all about? I mean, what's the, what's the big message? Why, why are we here? What is, what is this, this thing called life about? And, um, you know, it's surely, and and now I can tell you now that I found this, this, um, this photographic process in this way to share with the world. And, and, um, you know, it surely is not about, money and um, capital and and um, physical things um, there is so much more out there more meaningful stuff so what I do here um, you know obviously I have to keep my eye on the ball with my business because my my youngest daughter's seven so I've got some years to go yet but um, um, what I do you know in my studio on Fridays um, is so far uh, more of a spiritual kind of thing than anything I ever could have done in my corporate life. I, I always thought my, my company was going to be my legacy for some reason. It was very, very naive, and I've spoken about this before. Um, so, you know, you, you get to a point um, where you just you start asking yourselves, what is this all about? And then you do some searching, and, and I just was just so very fortunate to be able to stumble upon this and, and find this, this um, process that um, it just feels like this is what I was always meant to do. Right. And because you had never had any form of photography experience, but it's like everyone needs to watch your documentary and then they'll really get a grasp of like what you do, because this is a work of art. The process that you put into every one of these photos is absolutely stunning. Yeah, it's it's all about um, slowing things down. The old process is, uh, is much slower than modern day photography, for instance. I have students um, from the University of Mary and the Bismarck State College. I have about five to six classes a year come out, um, and I and I tell the students, you know, um, you know, we we're so in much of a hurry. We're taking more digital photographs today in the last 24 hours than we did in the hundred, the, than more digital photographs than all photographs taken in the first 150 years of photography, and that's in one day. So we have this you know, this um, large amounts of photographs being taken all the time. And we've kind of lost uh, composition and all of that. And, and um, for instance, uh, not to get too technical, but my exposure times in my studio are about 10 seconds. So your digital camera on your phone will take a picture in one sixtieth of a second. So I tell the students, um, it takes about 600 times longer to take a portrait. Um, and if you look about this romantically, and I've said this many times before, I'm not actually just taking a snapshot of people. I'm actually taking 10 second movies of them. So there's, there's, um, you know, blood's coursing through their veins. Their heart beats about 12, 15 times. They take a couple shallow breaths. There may be a blink. And what I, I, I like most about this is that maybe um, if that person has a thought during that 10 seconds, that that thought is somehow transferred to the plate. And it's the only way that I look about it. And, um, and when you when you open your mind up to this um, new way of creating it, it's just been spectacular. So what what gave you the passion to um, look in want to look into the wet plate photography and uh, you know like how you describe it already in general is just you know it really inspires me and I think you could use that with a lot of different contexts you know but man the the art I've always been curious about artists and photography you know art through that what gave you the passion in, in this specifically. Well, the passion had to be there. I, I think I just didn't know where to apply the passion. So I've always, I've always been, I, I was a creative person, I was a visual person, and I've, I've realized that after finding a camera for the first time, you know, eight years ago, that you know, I've always looked at things visually um, in in certain contexts. But you know, when you're making these images that I'm making are, are made out of pure silver, and silver doesn't degrade, so these images will be here hundreds of years from now. Um, they will outlast any other photograph I've ever taken of whoever I'm taking the picture of. Um, so when you think about these long time frames and that these things are going to be left behind, you go back into, you know, what is this all about? And, and you know, what, do, do we want to have proof that we existed? Is, is there something significant of leaving a record of our lives behind? And, and there's no better way, the visual record of a wet plate, than to leave, you know, um, a, a wet plate will be here a thousand years from now. Um, which you just can't say about other um, photographic processes. So uh, it puts you in a different mindset. But, you, you you know, it's not like I came to all this and you ask me about my inspiration. I, you know, 
Um, I saw a photograph online. I asked what it was. It was a he, the gentleman told me it was a web plate, and I just decided to chase this with no photographic experience whatsoever. So I never owned really a camera ever before. My five by seven um, web plate camera that I had built for me. So, um, and I wasn't doing it for anyone else. That's the other thing too. Is that sometimes um, you know you just do things for yourself. So I had. I had no idea that anyone would be interested in what I was doing out in my warehouse at the time. I've got a uh, natural light studio here now built in my backyard. Um, the first one built in this country in over a hundred years um, from the ground up. And, but I was working in a, in a warehouse with no windows in a back corner. And it's just, you know, there's bottles and chemicals and light fixtures. And it just looked like some mad scientist place. And, and, um, but you know, um, that's where I, I did, I started my work and I just slowly, slowly um, tried to improve. And and I wasn't doing it for anyone else but myself. Yeah, that picture of your studio and uh, of you in there. And um, man, that just that studio absolutely looks amazing. And I can't wait till Catherine and I can come up there and check that baby out because you got all these photos out there and that that natural, um, you know, the glass that comes through to get the natural light. God dang. Yeah, it's how they made photographs. You know, they didn't have electricity um, back in the day. So you never, uh, back in the Victorian era, you weren't taking pictures at night. So everything had to be done during the day. And, you know, we can cheat nowadays with electricity and stuff. But um, it's nice um, when I was able to get the natural light and get away from the electric lights and um, just using the sun. um, It's just uh, my work has just uh, gone to the next level. Um, But it's it's been a, a slow um, progression um, from my early work and uh, you know I think at first I was making giant leaps at that at, at sometimes and, and now it's um, you know these are little baby steps or minuscule little changes um, to just improve and to, and to, and to search um, you know to search for that perfect image hoping hoping I never get that perfect web plate um, I, I don't I don't have that desire to ever find perfection um, because of it. and again, it, it goes back to your example of having a job and just kind of get monotonous or whatever. Um, but it's this, it's imperfect process because there's nothing perfect about this and it's very difficult. Um, but it's, uh, it's that pursuit of perfection that just keeps you, uh, keeps me coming back. So, um, I never want to, um, I never want to perfect anything. I just want to strive to get better slowly. And I, um, you know, and the, one of the most beautiful parts of this process is that uh, the, the wonderful people that have been brought into my life, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people um, have come into my life now that I never would have met if I didn't have this this um, this artistic outlet. Yeah. And so you like with you've done hundreds of people and it's like you've had outstanding people like Evander Holyfield, you've had the great grandfather or grandson of Sitting Bull, you have had some like big names that you have had, like, you know, the privilege of working with that they've trusted you with that intimate process of, you know, this photography that you do because they have to sit with you for so long to take their picture. And then you run and you develop and you, you know, it's like you watch that turn magically in your hands before their eyes. And I, and I share the whole, the whole process with everyone. It's, it's never just sit down, let me do my thing. Um, it's always a collaboration. It's always, um, it's always explaining. So if you, when you guys come in and you've never seen the process, obviously uh, we should say that there's, we think there's about a thousand of us in the world that um, can do this process. I always joke that there's probably more underwater basket weavers in the world than there are wet plate clothing photographers. I mean, out of 8 billion people, there's only a thousand of us that are doing this. So this, it's this niche little community of people around the globe um, that continue to keep this, uh, this, this very old um, form of photography alive. And I just, it, it's nice to be part of that and to, and to share it with the, the present day. I, I think Archer would, would be proud of that. There's still a group of us. Um, um, if you would show him a camera and then explain to him that, well, no, we're still practicing your photography too from 165 years ago. You know, he'd probably look at you kind of like you're crazy or something, but um, yeah, it's, you know, the, the probably the biggest person to, um, Evander Holyfield, uh, that plate went to the Smithsonian, but my Greta Thunberg um, image uh, down at Standing Rock, uh, again, the trust with my Native American friends and their culture, um, one phone call down to there and they, um, the students and the kids and the, and the tribe gave up 15 minutes of their time with Greta um, to give to me as a gift. And in that 15 minutes, I did my best to 
make them proud and um, um, standing for us all, which is probably the most uh, of the two plates that I did is the, the one that's most popular. That's at the Library of Congress now. And um, that image, uh, Greta shared it again like a week and a half ago. So we're over 3 million views and likes and shares on social media with that one image. Um, so it's, uh, it's rather remarkable um, that to get to um, that image has been, it's on, it was on a billboard blown up on the side of a, a building in France. Um, it's been, it was uh, projected on the side of a building in, in downtown Los Angeles. Um, it's in, there's four large, uh, 10 foot tall murals that are, um, you know, one here, one in Fargo, one in New York, one in, um, and Standing Rock that, um, where Greta is, uh, displayed around the country. So it was, uh, it was quite the, uh, quite the journey. And that, that cont- journey continues and that friendship continues because I, I just talked to Greta and her father last, uh, about 10 days ago. So, um, there was a an exhibition in her home country of Sweden that had uh, put on display like a eight foot tall um, standing for us all my image. They blew it up, asked me permission, and I said, oh, "Sure." It was about um, climate change, climate change, and the environment. And I said, "Sure." And then that gave them the, the file, and they blew it up. And then Greta heard about it, so she went. Her and her father went over to the museum and stood in front of the uh, the mural for me. And then he snapped a picture of her standing in front of it for me, in front of me. So. Um, it's, uh, you know, and then that, then that, um, the museum was so excited that the image drew her into the museum, you know what I mean? So it was, you know, everyone, everyone wins. That's awesome. Cause you're in the documentary, it says that, you know, this is your life's work and that you're wanting to spread awareness to creating a piece of this history. And so you're definitely leaving your mark here. And, and it's not just in the United States. It's not just North Dakota. You are doing this on a global level. Yeah, well, it, it just, it just um, you know, I just found out this week that the Pitt Rivers Museum, uh, the University of Oxford, Oxford University in the UK, they're going to be, they're going to be taking some original Native American plates too. Um, so it, I have 27 different archives around the, the globe, including India, and, um, like I said, the Library of Con- Congress, the Smithsonian, the Heard Museum down in Arizona, which is, uh, you know, one of the, um, the, the preeminent Native American museums in in the world um, had some of my original works. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I'm just I'm just fortunate to be here, and I just don't want to let anyone down. And I just want to continue to create my work. And I I've only been doing this for eight years now, and um, I just you know I'm excited about what the next eight years will what the next eight years will bring or the next sixteen years will bring. Well, we, I appreciate the, the modesty and the, the humbleness that you show, but you obviously you're an amazing human being and your creativity has touched many lives and many hearts. So I do hope that you oh, pay, that's pay gratitude to that's yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's, you know, I always, I always say that it, I'm too close to my work to know if it's any good. So um, I, I have to rely on other people's uh, opinions of it. And, um, you know, I, I think, and I've said this more than once, um, you know, the more work I make, the less I like my work, um, which is, uh, you know, it's reassuring. Um, it, it means that, uh, um, you know, my uh, the level that I'm trying to attain may be changing, but um, it's, it's a difficult process. And, uh, you know, you just do your best. And, and it's fun being, um, you know, with other artists around the world and being there, there's like European clothing weekend, you know, you want to talk about positive stuff. So there's a, uh, there's been a gathering and we missed it this year, but there's a gathering in Europe in Netherlands where I was able to the year before, um, go there and hang out with 50 wet plate artists in a field for, for the weekend. And it was just absolutely amazing to have, to see all these online friends that I've known all these years and then to actually get to meet them and shake their hands and give them a hug and, and be able to create together in this field. It was just, uh, it was rather remarkable. So, um, I, I always, you know, I always look at people come into my studio on Fridays and they get caught up in, in what we're doing here. And, and then, you know, a lot of times I just stop and say, isn't this, you know, isn't this fun for adults just to be able to play? And, and everyone just kind of acknowledges that, is that that's what I feel like I'm doing. Like I'm, I'm like a kid again. Like I, I, I'm just, I'm getting to play, um, um, in my studio and, and what more can someone want? I mean, to be able to do this once a week in here, it's just, 
it's absolutely amazing. And and the studio, I, I opened up the studio, um, and I should say that because I mean, we're, we're this is a uh, uh, your podcast is a is a um, you know from this area that uh, I open this studio up to any artist that wants to use it. So if I'm not in here, um, I open the doors and the people call me and say, "Can I take pictures in there? Or can we shoot video in there? Or whatever they need it for." I don't. I don't care what they want to do in here. Um, I just leave the door open and they can come in and use it at no cost. So it's, it, I'm trying to make it this little, um, this little hub of creativity here in North Dakota. And it's just my way of paying back because this, this facility, this, this building and stuff is just way too, way too nice just to have it sit here dormant sometimes. And I, and I always feel like when other artists bring their work in, there, there's, there's something about that vibe that stays here. So the, the more, creativity that comes into this place the more this place has its own um own meaning if, if that makes sense yeah that's awesome you know i came across this quote while i was uh, checking some of your stuff out and you had said uh art can be a weapon for change and we artists have the ability to wield it and it kind of segues me into you know tell us about your your book the northern plains native americans um, a modern wet plate perspective and kind of what to, what that means to you, uh, how you would explain the passion for it. And, uh, you know, at some point, you know, get into a little bit how that, uh, how you actually take a picture and how that technology works. Yeah. So it all started, um, I was making wet plates and then, um, I was, uh, I learned about, um, Orlando Scott Goff, a wet plate artist here in Bismarck, North Dakota. I had learned that there was a historic wet plate photographer, um, back in the 1880s here in Bismarck, and I did some research on him, and uh, it uh, turned out that he was the uh, photographer to capture the first ever photograph of Sitting Bull um, here or around Bismarck, North Dakota. So Orlando Scott Goff, uh, Orlando Scott Goff is credited with that task. And if anyone wants to l- read about if there, you have any history buffs that listen to the show, um, if you go to Google and type in Orlando Scott Goff, G-O-F-F. Um, the first or second link down will be a document from the Historical Society of North Dakota. So I worked for two years with Lou Hoffermel, uh, a local historian, um, documenting. Um, there had never been any book written about this man or any paper or anything about his life. And we pieced together over two years um, this definitive peer-reviewed paper on the life and times of Orlando Scott Goff and his work. And it was my way of just wanting to bring back and pay homage to a man that I obviously never met. But um, I I always thought that wouldn't it be cool if someone 150 years from now wanted to do some retrospective on my work. So it was it was that kind of thing. And and the Historical Society of North Dakota um, made that document their entire um, quarterly journal was dedicated to that. And you can learn about him. So he had taken the first ever photograph of Sitting Bull. I found out that um, the great grandson of City Bill, Early Little Point, was um, still around, and uh, he was in South Dakota. So I placed a call to him, and I, I, I that's documented in the documentary as well. I placed a call into him, and he picked up the phone. And within a week of that call, he was in my studio. So I captured the great grandson of City Bill in the same process in the same city as Orlando Scott Goff 135 years later, and it was that. Um, the Northern Plains Native American books you're referring to. It's Ernie's uh, picture called Eternal Field that's on the cover of that book um, that started this entire process. And I didn't, again, it wasn't anything planned or, I, um, but, you know, I shared that image and that image um, caught the eye of the historical side in North Dakota and they, it knocked down the doors over there. Um, so that was the first plate that they had ever um, taken of mine into their um, archive. And, they have nearly 600 of my plates as of now. So um, they got this, it's called Shane Shelf in the State Archives. And uh, you go in there and there's all these boxes and these acid-free sleeves, all my original plates of all my Native Americans and some other plates that I've done some of my creative work um, is indefinitely stored in their, their climate-controlled um, vault, which is, um, as a photographer, I mean, it's it's huge. Um uh, you know, to have that trust and to have garnered that trust, but it wasn't, you know, it was, it was a slow, it was a slow burn kind of thing to, to get to, um, one step at a time. And, and, um, that's where I'm at today. And, 
I, you know, every month or so, three weeks or so, I take more plates up there. And I, the, the series is, uh, the end goal for the series is 1,000 Native American portraits. And um, so I shot plate 452 this week. And I've been on this for nearly seven years. So um, it's about a 15 to 20 year journey. So every 250, I'm approaching 500 plates now. So I'll make a second book in 2021, hopefully. Um, we're starting to work on that. And uh, <clears throat> at the end of a thousand plates, we will have uh, four books sitting on the shelf. And uh, that's what that series is all about. But it's, um, um, I, I didn't have any Native Americans as friends when I took that first ever photograph of Ernie. And um, it's just uh, amazing where I, I find myself now. And it's one of those things, like you said, this is a long series. So it's going to be a long process, 15 to 20 years. And so it's definitely one of those things. It's like your patience has to become part of the art and part of the positivity in your movement of doing this, because you said, you know, it's not that instant gratification. So it all is about enjoying those small victories along the way. Every little picture that you do get to do and every little sitting that you do, it's like, kind of builds up that excitement and that anticipation and that gratitude a little bit more. It just stacks those images. So every, like I, I made another, I captured um, uh, more images this last Friday and they, it just keeps building on, on that, that, that groundwork that we've already worked on. So it just, it becomes more relevant. It becomes more significant with every place. And, and it is about little victories. Cause I mean, this is a, it's a daunting task. And, and I, and I, I was going to do 10 portraits to start for the series and then I went to 50 and then I went to 100. And when I got to 100, it was like, I'd rather just throw the gauntlet down and do something significant. And um, and then I made the crazy, I had the audacity to say, well, let's try to do a thousand Native American portraits. And um, it's, uh, um, it's just a, it's every day you just celebrate the, the next portrait and you just keep going and keep your head down. And I just hope I have enough time um, to, to do this. Um, as an oncology nurse, we should also tell your listeners I'm an oncology nurse by, by trade. So, um, you know, I've hand that, held the hands of many people as they've passed away. And I know that we're only here so long. And, and um, the positive part to take about that is that, you know, what do you, what do you want to do with the time that you're here? We're all, all of us are only getting so much time here. And we, we should try to make the best of, of, um, of what we got and what we're able to do. And for me, it's always when you're as fortunate as me and I'm, you have no idea how fortunate I am in so many ways. But when you're, when you get to that point, if people are as lucky as myself to get to that point where you're so fortunate, um, it's about giving back. It's about, you know, now use what you have and maybe give back to someone else. And then that lifts them up and then they can get lifted up and, then they give back to someone else and then that person gives back to someone else. And it's this, um, this evolution of, uh, of positivity and, and, and kindness towards each other. Um, and we can all lift ourselves up simultaneously, slowly, you know, if you, if you look at it that way. And, and that's kind of the way that I've been looking at it as recently, but you know, it was also in the search of what's the, why are we here? What is the, what is, you know, I bought a, telescope a 14 inch telescope and i studied the stars for a couple of years and i learned all about astrophysics and and string theory and um, physics and, uh, and the theory of relativity and all these things and they, I, these are things I, I was looking and searching before i even found web plate photography I, I don't know where i was i was just looking for answers in any form or any shape and um this thing just fell in my lap and and i just you know, I was just fortunate enough to um, be stupid enough to chase it, <laughs> and <laughs> and, if I, and to get myself to this this the, in, to this position. And now now I, I have, you know, I really feel like I know where I'm going to be spending the rest of my time. Where am I? You know, where am I going to be focusing? I, I, you know, I'm 51 years old now. I, I have this idea, and that's why I built the studio here in my backyard. Um, because I, I didn't want it to be somewhere else. I wanted it to be, you know, uh, 80, 85 year old man. Uh, God bless him. I'm able to walk down the hill with a cane or something and get into my studio and create, um, pictures. It was just, you know, it just felt, felt natural to have it here at the house so that it was, um, it just is, um, it was very close to me. I can come down here whenever I want and just, uh, 
in the quiet and just create and do all the things that I need to do down here. It's, it's rather remarkable. So I have this little um, sanctuary of creativity and I, and I can escape from the world when I need to. And, um, but I didn't, you know, I didn't have that for, you know, I was 44 years of age when I found this. So, um, and uh, so I'm very fortunate. I, I keep telling you guys, I'm very fortunate. Well, it's a great way to put it, you know, really. Um, you know, one of the things that I thought was really um, an interesting concept, I'm sure you're, maybe as you first started this, you, you ran into some adversity here and there, but uh, one of the, the concepts was that, and it leads into um, to your, your name too that you were given, but uh, that when you take a photo, maybe you're capturing their soul. And uh, there was a discussion in the book about, you know, maybe uh, at least for that second, and you touched on this earlier too, that there's a part of them, that moment in time, and so on that for sure is, is, is stuck on that image, which really just made me step back for a minute and think of how important it is for us to, to take a step back and, you know, think, uh, enjoy, be present, you know, whether it's with your kids, if they're running around and you're busy doing a bunch of things and to just stop, you know, and put down that phone or shut the laptop and, you know, let them whatever, talk about what they need to, because to them it's important or, you know, if you're driving around and you do see something beautiful, how often do you pull over and, you know, just stop and look at it or watch a sunset? You know, so t- talk to me or us a little bit about um, that concept and, and how what they had said to you and, and how you express, you know, that in, in photography. Well, um, you know, I tell people all the time when they come in, they'll they always have their iPhones on them and they'll want to take pictures of, you know, the plate fixing or something like that. And I'll always tell them, just put your phone away. I'll take the pictures because I want you to be here and, and you know, enjoy this. Uh, you know, it's not every day you get your wet plate taken. So we'll, we'll put our devices away and let's just put this, uh, you know, put this into our memory banks. And um, it, it's just so much, so much better that way um, instead of uh, um, always always not being like you said present um, be present and, and try to uh, understand uh, that um, one of the things I've struggled with is that you know I'll, I'll take a portrait and we'll all just like high five and it's we're all excited about the and it's, it can be any given portrait and we're excited about it and and then um, you know then I asked the person I'll ask them I said well what if I drop this portrait I break it I shatter it and, and usually the sitter said well I'd be devastated I don't you know, I, I you know, I, I hate to lose that image. Like, and, but you know, twenty minutes prior to that, that image was nothing more than a you know a twelve dollar piece of glass and some silver in a bottle, and and it had no real value. That's to say, you know, all these pieces that have no value, they you know, they come together, and then when I get one of these portraits, uh, because these are one offs, that, that means there's no other way of duplicating these in the world. Um, there's only one wet plate, you know, that uh, the wet plate of Evander Holyfield is at the Smithsonian. That's the only one. I mean, I can have a scan of it. And we can do it on prints and we can do it on paper and we can even probably reproduce it on glass if we wanted to. But there's only one of those images. And when you make off these one-off images, um, and I've done this before. I, I've accidentally took a picture and I, I, I broke it or something happened to it. And then we sat, went back and sat back down the same person, same afternoon, just 15, 20 minutes later. And we try to recapture that moment and it can't be done because I could never, Steve, I could never, if I was doing your portrait, I could never capture Steve again from 28 minutes ago. And it doesn't matter. You wear the same thing. You sit in the same ch- chair. I, I don't even move the camera. It all just stays there, but I can never get back to that previous time. So these are like little fragments of our lives that are uh, represent. I mean, there's, there's no, we all waste a lot of 10 seconds of our lives, right? I mean, there's the things that we do just meaning, meaningless things um, that we do every day that takes approximately 10 seconds of our life. Um, you know, but when you do something and, and it's being documented this way, I just think it's, it's rather romantic and um, important that there's 10 seconds of my life, which is not a blink of an eye. Um, it's actually 10 seconds captured. Um, on the glass and, and I can never get another one. So when you think of these in these terms of um, one off um, and, and that's what I love about this process is that there's really the students will come in and they'll see a, a print on the table or 
on display on the wall or something like that. And they'll go, I love that work. And then, and then I'll say, well, that's not my work. And they say, well, you took the picture. I say, yeah, I took the picture, but it's not my work. And I'm trying to teach them that unless it's a piece of glass with silver on it, it's not my work. And these other things are all just fake representations of the, of, of what it is I'm really chasing here. Um, and, and, you know, I, I have to scan these things and I have to share them on Facebook. I mean, that's how I get my sitters and that's how people know my work, obviously. Um, but there's a difference. Everyone always comes in and the first thing they do, they walk into my studio and then they see the, the original, some of my original plates. I've got hundreds of them on the wall here. And the first thing they said is, well, I, I saw your work online, but I did not understand that this is completely different than I had thought. It's just much more beautiful in person than, than anything, any representation that you can do digitally. So um, it's an important thought. It's an important aspect. Yeah, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And uh, uh, we're going to be doing an interview here uh, maybe in a few weeks or a month with uh, someone around our area, uh, Dustin Sinners, his name. He's a artist around our area and uh, is is really good at painting and, and different aspects of it. Hmm. Um, and he also does, you know, photography, modern day kind of photography. And but the way that uh, um, his eye is too, I think, is really cool. So um, we were talking the other day, and I gave him all your information, and and he's going to watch everything and check it out, listen to our episode, and then we're going to hook up again and and talk but it's something okay. you know he wasn't familiar with either and like it reminds me of conversations with him too but uh i mean what a metaphor for life what you just said about the photography and, and the moment in time and the memory and it'll never be the same again you know it it reminds me of like decisions you know how one decision can change your life track and you know it just i don't know i'm almost almost just baffled at how you explain that it's just it and you use the word romantic like it is it's just beautiful how you put that out there it's a very intimate thing that you really do with these with every individual and you are you can feel that you are putting your heart and your soul into each one of these pictures along the way yeah it's all about it's all you know and i think you know that that final plate and then I asked the, the sitter, you know, why, you know, why, why is this so valuable now? This plate to you, there was nothing but some chemicals and a piece of glass just 20 minutes ago. And now it, it's sitting here on the shelf. It's an invaluable. What's the value of it? Is it, is it worth a dollar? Is it worth a hundred dollars? Is it worth a thousand dollars? What about, is it worth a million dollars? And none of those answers apply. I mean, it's an invaluable piece of, 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 of history. There, you can't put a dollar value on it. I mean, even like the Smithsonian put, uh, you know, a twenty-five thousand dollar value on my Vander Holyfield plate when they they send a climate control van here to, cut it, to collect it, a truck to collect it, and um, we had to double box and everything. Um, but you know, that that plate's worth it's, it's it's priceless. These these are priceless, and I think the emotion and the friendship and and that it you know it's that what happens is that that's time together making that it takes you know fifteen minutes, sometimes an hour to make a portrait. Um, it's that time together making it in that collaboration between me and my sitter and, and the trust and, and, uh, you know, I ask them their opinion and, and they put, they, they give input and I give input and we come up with something. I think it's, it, you know, that's where the value is, is that, is that relationship and the time that we spent together making something together. I think that's where all this intrinsic value comes from. Um, and that's how a piece of glass, um, and some chemicals becomes something far different in a, in a relative short amount of time. And I always struggled with that idea is why are these, why do I have feel these, you know, I, why do I feel the stress of, you know, dropping a plate or doing something to damage it after I make it. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's not just, I don't feel that stress in my Vander Holyfield or my Greta Thunberg uh, images. I mean, when I made Greta Thunberg's images, the plates have, they have to dry. Okay. And we were in the mobile dark room in, in my vehicle and they were sitting on the floorboard. So I had the only two wet plates of, 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 of her in the world in my possession. And I sat there and just, I just watched them dry. Um, and then I had to transport them home and I was stressed, but it's not just those plates. Those, you know, you would think important plates. It's any of the plates, like one of the plates that I made on Friday of a person that I'd never met before. It's just as valuable to me. I, I feel the same um, intrinsic um, duty um, to take care of that image. And, and that's why it's an honor for me to get these images up to these, these archives, these 27 archives that I have. Every, every plate that I could get into an archive, I've done, 
I believe I've done something really nice for the person that's in the picture because I've, I've preserved them. Okay. I took the photograph as the first thing, but the second thing is I preserved them because I, I keep saying that, you know, I've got, Oh, I've made 3000. I can walk over here to the desk real quick. So my plate, the last plate that I made on Friday was 3,728. I've made that many images in the last eight years. It's taken me that, that long to make that many exposures. And, um, I can, you know, I have to get them somewhere. If I, if I left, um, and it's in my will that all of my work on the wall here, my, my family will be picking out uh, three plates a piece to each one of my family members, the plates that they like, but then all the other ones will be in my will go up to the state historic society and, to protect them because I, I feel like I'm doing, I, I have a duty to the person that came in and spent the day with me or the afternoon or even to 20 minutes like Greta did. Um, I have a duty to them to do my best to try to, pass that on i mean why are we making all these images um why are we making all these images we we want to it's a record of who we are and it's not always about history is always in the past and we have to understand that we're making history um you know today when greta thunberg came to standing rock i mean that's history um uh, there's like 150 national and international articles written about that that work over you know the, the few months following um, me capturing her image there and um, there's a duty to the to the images and uh, that's what I'm trying to do by getting in place because if I left all these images to my family um, you know my kids will covet my work because they you know they care for dad and they're, yeah that's dad's work and they know how hard that I worked oh, so after my kids they leave it to their kids and then their their kids would have to decide well okay um, okay we love grandpa and we'll take care of grandpa's images um, but then their kids and then their kids at some point you get so far away from removed from who I was or what I was about or uh, there's no attachment um, 300 years from now or 200 years from now 150 years from now back to me that you know these works could find themselves in a dumpster or you know sold online or I don't know what would happen to them but there's there's this um, I feel a duty to take care of the images and and, and I'm compelled um, to do that because of the trust that some of my sitters have given me and their time that they've given me. Well, and you know, you said it's a piece of history, but this is a raw piece of history. There's no Photoshopping going into this. There's no selfie mode. Let's throw on a filter and take one more because we didn't no. like that. This is raw and organic history that you are making. If there's, you know, if I want to change a photograph, I've got some chemicals where I actually can, uh, it's called farmer's reducer now, and I don't need to get too technical, um, but there's a chemical now that I can actually, I've learned from a historic, um, a historic recipe where I can actually strip silver off the plate. So I can actually edit if there's a little swirl or something I don't want, I can go in there and, but you understand my Photoshop is, is essentially me sitting there with droplets of uh, fear cyanide liquid dropping it onto my plate and erasing molecules of silver on my plate. Or if there's a part of my, like maybe there's a corner or an edge that I don't like, I can actually take my glass cutter out and trim that down and cut it off. I mean, that's the kind of cropping that I have. Um, <laughs> but every time you cut, you know, it's a very, it's a very scary proposition. You know, these plates I've, I've been talking so um, fondly about, um, you know, to take a glass cutter and cut it because you always had the chance of breaking the plate in a place that you didn't want to cut it. So, um, but, they, but these are things that um, that I can do, and but that's it, it's very hands on. It's very um, analog, and if you if you want to crop something, you grab your glass cutter out and you crop it off the off the plate. But it's it's a dangerous thing. So times have changed so much. I mean, we don't we don't understand how um, how uh, I don't know how we are. Modern technology gives us so many things. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, the older processes just did not have. And they just, they did what they were doing um, the best they could. My grandmother is 95 years old, and she always tells me that we have all gotten really soft compared to how things were when she was a child. <laughs> you know, and it's like true, right? and the advancement of technology and all those things. And that's like all the stories that they could tell you. And that's like what your pictures are going to be able to do is tell a whole different story in another 95 or 100 years. Yeah, it's just a permanent record. It's just a permanent record, and everyone, you know, to, you know, everyone's important. Everyone's important. There's no um, entry to level to enter my Native American series or 
you know, um, or even comes to for my camera. I'm, I'm booked about seven months out from my Friday session. So I'm just continuously adding people that want, you know, they, so these people that come in, they've been some wait five, six, seven months to get into my studio. So when they, you know, they wait that long and then they come in, um, you know, I have a, I have a responsibility to them to, you know, to have, make them have their experience here, um, be meaningful and, and, and to live up to that. And, and I think it's that, um, and then they walk away from here and then they tell someone about what I'm doing here. And then it's just been an evolving kind of slow, but there's, there's no, um, there's no magic formula on how, uh, you know, you just share, you create, you be kind and you be generous and, you, um, and you, uh, just try to do what you can for someone else. So and I'm trying to do that with my photography. Um, tell, tell me a bit, uh, or tell us about the shadow catcher and how, um, how that came about. Well, Calvin Grinnell, the, the elder from the MHA nation, um, man that had out to nation. He, um, called me on the phone. He had been out to my studio a couple of times and he knew what I had taken his portrait a couple of times. And, and he, uh, just called me on the phone and, um, said, uh, just out of the blue, he says, I have your name. And I said, oh, what do you mean? And I he says, well, I have your name. And I said, what do you mean? He says, I have your Native American name. And I, 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 at that moment, I think I almost fell off my chair because it was just um, out of left field. I, I never I never had um, thought that that honor would ever come my way. Um, and uh, so he wanted to have a formal ceremony in my studio, which we did. With, um, so we had witnesses exchanging a gift. We had food. And we had this formal ceremony where he gave me the name and um, uh, and I'm, I'm destroying that, but it's the best I can do. It's in Hidatsa and it means shadow catcher. Um, so going back to what you had talked about earlier, Steve, is that um, back in the day, you know, a photographer, all photographers, by the way, historically speaking, were called shadow catchers. So that was, that's what they called photographers were called shadow catchers. All of them were. And, um, so, you know, a photographer would come into a tribe, say, for instance, um, like Edward Curtis would go into a tribe and, and he would take a picture of the chief or, you know, one of the, one of the, the children or whatever he was taking a picture of. And, and he would be able to show them this image of this reflection of themselves on this piece of glass or tin. And, you know, when you and Catherine come into my studio and I show you this process, it's, it's 20, 2020 you're going to think that this is magic. I'm, I'm, I'm going to perform magic for you. I mean, that's how fabulous this process is for people that have never seen it before. But can you imagine, how, how, you know, and you, you and your wife have seen all this technology, you know about all the things, bits and bytes and TV screens and monitors and all these things. And here, I'm going to show you this 165 year old photographic process and you're going to think it's magic. Well, can you imagine what the Native Americans would have thought? when, you know, these photographers who come in with their wagons and, and do these photographs. So they had the feeling that, you know, okay, so he took that portrait and he's driving away in his wagon with that portrait. And they had this feeling that, you know, that, um, and I, I, I'm not saying everyone, but this is where this whole this concept comes of the feeling someone's shadow or their soul is that, you know, how can he leave with that picture of our chief when he's still here with us? And there's that disconnect, there's that, how he, he, he must have taken some of our chief with him because he, you know, he's two miles away from our camp right now. And we know that that plate's still in his possession and still got our picture, our chief's picture. So there, you know, that's where that entire thing came about. And, and, um, the moment that Kelvin gave me this name, this formal name, which is the, the largest honor of my life, um, that day, um, when my uh, native American friends, come in now they're they're no longer strangers they're my brothers and sisters and um and i was completely totally dedicated to this series before the naming ceremony um but as soon as i was given that formal name and uh, the reaction that i get from people in the community that know me as shadow catcher now um and the respect that i get as shadow catcher and um i just i just can't let them down I just have, you know, it was, it was like tenfold what I felt before. Um, and again, it was all unexpected, but I, I just cannot let them down. So every time that they come in, every time someone comes into the series and they, they're driving in from all over the place. I just had someone fly in last week from California. I mean, flew in during a pandemic 
in Bismarck, North Dakota to come into my studio and spend three hours with me to do portraits. And then he got back on a plane as well. Um, you know, you have to, yeah, I got to put them in the best light I possibly can. And there's a lot of pressure there and I feel the pressure. Um, and I just try to do the best that I can for them. Yeah. How, how do you, you know, how do you deal with some of that pressure? Is there, um, I mean, I think your work speaks for itself when you look, look online, um, at your website and you watch the documentary, you know, your passion comes out in every bit of that, but, uh, you know, are there some practices that you do to kind of stay positive and not let it just get you into a rut or, you know, keep you, it's, keep you upset? It's never a rut. It's, it's like intent. It's what, what is my intent? My intent is to do, do the best portrait. Understand I'm, I'm not the best photographer in the world. I mean, I, um, you know, I've got a long ways to go yet. So, um, but it's the intent when they come in, um, I don't think anyone's ever come in and not felt that Shane did the best darn job that he could on that given day um, for that, that portrait. And it, you know, I say it's stress and all of that, but it, it's not in a bad way. It's, um, it, it's in a, it's in a good way. Um, I get into this mode when I'm creating and, and I just like time will just like, I, I get so focused that I just, things can just fall around <laughs> fall down around me and I just don't care. I just, they're the only thing that I'm worried about at this particular moment um, is, is making that plate. We, I had an example, I was in the dark room one time and I was making, I was developing a plate and I set a, I accidentally set a large bottle of water up on the shelf and I was developing the plate and the shelf and the bottle came down and it sounded like the whole building came down. Water was splashed everywhere, broke glass everywhere. It was a total disaster. I had like, it was a big bottle of water and, and there was water everywhere. And I just kept like developing that plate. I mean, I just, I didn't even, I didn't stop what I was doing. I just kept doing what I had to, to get that image. Cause I didn't care about the shelf or whatever else was happening. As long as nobody was hurt. Um, I didn't care about any of that. All I was focused on is getting this plate and I can, I can pick up the pieces to everything else. So it's, it, um, I get rather focused when I'm when I'm working, and and that was one of the realizations of. And we should tell your listeners if they want to watch the documentary, they can um, they can get it on Amazon Prime. It's Balkowitz, so B A L K O W I T S C H. It's on Amazon Prime, or if someone's out of the country, they can get it on Vimeo. It's also available on Vimeo, and um, you know, it's uh, it was it was a wonderful. Uh, it was a wonderful journey having um, Greg and Chelsea chase me around for a year and a half, um, and and to document the uh, document the work that I'm doing here. They wanted to do a five minute short, and and you know uh, a year and a half in, they were it was an hour long documentary on my work. So it was it definitely was, uh, really interesting to watch and see like the process of your sittings with just like your individuals, and then seeing the process of developing developing those pictures. Because how long is it after you snap that picture? that you have to put the chemical or do the whole process. Well, if like- it dries, it's called wet plate for a reason. So if it dries, you lose the image. So, you know, in a climate controlled building like this, we probably have maybe eight to 10 minutes or so, you know, outside when it's 90 degrees, um, you know, you only have a couple minutes sometimes. It, it all depends. But that was the, the funny thing about, about the documentary is because I never, the documentary we need to say is, is was their work. I didn't, I didn't commission this. Um, they didn't get paid. I didn't get paid. Uh, nothing. They decided to do this out of the goodness of their hearts, um, and wanted thought that my story. W- um, this is the first documentary, and so I saw it when it was completely done. I had no, I never had seen any footage of it at all until it was completely done. I went over to Greg's house and they put it on the big TV, and I sat there and watched the documentary for the first time. And I had him pause it about ten minutes in. I'm saying, <laughs> "Is this actually how I am?" It was this weird, you know. I'd never had this experience of watching myself before create. Right. And they said, well, that's how you always are, Shane. And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I'm that serious. I'm like, you know what I mean? I'm just, some point, point that sometimes it's frantic. Sometimes it's, you know, there's all these emotions and stuff. And, I, and until I saw myself in that documentary um, acting that way and, and with the concentration and the way that I am, I think there's one point in the documentary where we're making that picture of uh, <coughs> Liberty Trudges to Injustice. And I, I and I, I think I said, God, just give me anything on the plate or something like that. I'm walking in the dark room. I mean, I'm like saying little prayers and 
you know what I mean? The talking to the Collodian gods, I, I don't, I'll, I'll do anything to get that image. And so, uh, but you know, those big collaborations that uh, you're, you're talking, it was like 52 people in eight months of planning. Right. So there, there's a lot of pressure there. And it, people look at it like you seem stressed and it's like, well, yeah, I don't, I don't feel it that way. You know what I mean? I may appear that way, but I'm in my element. And if I could, you know, when I'm, when I'm creating, I'm, I'm just a happy man. So, you know, that becomes um, your adrenaline rush in a sense. Like I'm, I'm kind of an adrenaline junkie myself. And so when things become mm -hmm. really busy like that or really hectic, like that's when I feel the most in my zone. And so that's kind of what this becomes for you. Yeah. From the outside though, it looks like chaos or, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, it, like, oh, I mean, that may not, you know, you may look at that. Well, that doesn't look like he's having fun doing that. That's, that's the furthest thing from the truth. Um, because the reward is at the end of the image, like all the work up to the image. It doesn't really matter how you get to the final image as long as you get there, right? Whatever you have to do, whatever you have to do, it doesn't matter if you got to do 10 jumping jacks right before taking the plate. Uh, whatever you think you have to do to get that image, stand on your head, go ahead. Um, whatever you think you need to do or your sitter needs to do. And um, But that's where the rewarding is, is when some of these more difficult shots and difficult poses and, and things that were these collaborations that we have – the more difficult and, and um, difficult it is, the more rewarding that final image is. Because only you and the person or the people that are involved knew what it took to get that. Everyone else online just gets to, oh, that's that's the cool image, or I get to see that, right? They have no idea. I took a, a picture of a young six-year-old Native American um, uh, water protector on Friday, and I mean, six years old is very young. I, I usually say, you know, I. I don't usually shoot most people under the age of eight. Eight is even rather young because you have to hold completely still. And I have this head brace and you can only blink once and you can't move at all if you do, you're all blurry. So a six-year-old, it is a daunting test. So this little six-year-old comes in with her dad and her mom. And I had known a swan before her mom. And, um, you know, she comes in and, you know, she puts her regalia on and, and she gets grabs you. She wanted her little BB gun in the shot. So she had her little BB gun and we sat her down and the little, even the little BB gun, she's sitting there and I could watch her hand and she's holding her BB gun and, you know, she's moving a little bit. You'd have like two barrels on the plate and it would like, you know, it would just ruin the image. So her dad got down on his back and put his hands up and held the BB gun out of, right out of frame. So he's, her dad's laying in the foreground with his hands, helping her hold this BB gun. I mean, people don't, you know, they see the image of this little girl in this BB gun. They had no idea that her father and, you know, what this little girl had to do. Um, she had to sit there for like 15 minutes while I composed and got everything ready. And she just, she wanted, she was so dedicated. And I mean, her mom said, she's a good listener. Don't worry, Shane. And I'm like, oh my goodness, we got a six-year-old we're trying to take a wet plate out. And um, darned if she did not do it. I mean, um, but people don't, you know, you don't see the dad laying down on the ground right in front of the image. You know what I mean? Like I, so there's this magical part. There's all these things that can be, just outside, like the that photograph of Ernie Lapointe, the great grandson of Sitting Bull, on the front of my book, Eternal Field. There's a waste management dumpster just ten feet out of out of the the frame, and there's semis and cars. There's a freeway behind Ernie in that picture. If you look at him in the field, there's cars driving by, and and they're so fast. The process is so slow; it didn't pick up any of it. And Ernie was standing there, going, "How is this going to ever turn out? There's cars driving and." I got this, you know, this dumpster sitting here, and but it, it, but that's the magic of it is that it doesn't matter as long as you get to the final image. It doesn't matter what else had to occur or what else was going on at that time. As long as the final image stands on its own, um, that's 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 the miraculous part. That's the, that's the best part of it all. Right. Now, tell me more about your collaborations as well for everyone. It's like, how many have you done of these where you're recreating these old portraits or these old paintings? Yeah, so we uh, we started with Murderer's Gulch. Um, so the city of Bismarck let us take over an alley. There was actually a Murderer's Gulch here in Bismarck um, back in the 1800s. Um, there was like 14 people who were um, documented to have been killed in this little alley. It was where a bunch of bad people lived and the saloon was there. And, and I mean, this is very well documented, this place. So we went uh, into an alley in Bismarck and there was uh, a whole bunch of us collaborators, over 40 of us got together and we took over this alley and we did Murderer's Gulch. Um, and then we did the uh, Capsizing of Humanity the following year, um, where we did, um, based off the Raft of the Medusa, 
uh, which is at the Louvre. Um, we made a uh, waves and everything out in the middle of the field and built a boat and, and had, um, you know, all the collaborators there. And then we did Liberty Trudges Through Injustice was another large collaboration um, where we were trying to um, reproduce Liberty Leading the People, which is funny is when I got to go to Louvre in France uh, last year, um, you go into the Louvre and Liberty Leading the People and the Raft of Medusa are side by side on a wall in the Louvre. And I had no idea. And I made these subsequent two images, just pick them out of nowhere um, and to kind of chase these, these images. So Sabrina Hornog was Our Lady Liberty and um, and we were able to, uh, that was, uh, I think it was 52 people and that took us about eight months to collaborate. So we bring in hair and makeup, we uh, costume design, set design. Um, it, it's like a movie set and, and we, we have one planned this next July. So um, we're going to be addressing Merrick Doyce, the, uh, uh, one of the, one of the professors out at the University of Mary, he's my director, and he decided that we're going to, I, I wanted to give him, um, this will be our fourth big one together. So um, we, we missed one this year because of the pandemic, but we're going to address the plague next year. So in July, we're going to, um, there's a, four, a 15th century painting that we are inspired by about the plague, and there's going to be skeletons and coffins and, and um, you know, plague doctors and all kinds of things going on. It's, it's, it's going to be a huge shot. And I've got, I've got over a hundred people so far signed up to uh, assist us with that. And uh, that'll be next July. So um, it's just a, it's a, just a collaboration um, um, between me and a bunch of friends, a bunch of artist friends, like-minded people. And, and we don't do it. Nobody makes any money. I don't make any money. They don't get paid. Everyone just gets paid in limited edition prints. Everyone gets a print if you're, you're involved. Um, you get a print and, um, and it's just the plate goes up to the heritage center with all of our names on it. And, and it's just, a it's just a way of creating together to kind of, again, show that, that, the, uh, you know, show a little bit of who we are here. Wow. You know, I think what's one of the most inspirational things to me throughout this entire episode is I can't keep, can't stop going back to thinking, um, just how, <laughs> how modest you are about what, what you've done and what you've accomplished is, is uh, something that's lost on uh, a lot of society today. You know, there's a lot of, uh, um, well, speaking of Cat Perkins, our mutual friend, we talk a lot about social media and how it's really made people be so aggressive and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and almost just uh, lash out each other. These keyboard warriors is a phrase we throw out a lot. And, um, you know, you, you were blessed with your business and uh, you decided to pick this up after you were inspired and if you were 44 years old, you know, it shows people it's never too late to start something, uh, you know, and, and you never know what's going to happen. So, so jump all in, you know, and, but you, you still, still it. yeah, you still mention baby steps with it too. And like everything you say just can be applied to so many different aspects of personal development or trying to change your mindset or just life in general. And I can't, um, I don't know. Like you, you, you're really inspiring on so many different levels, really. Yes. Well, I mean, a cat, a cat is a is a perfect example, right? I mean, she gives back all the time. I mean, from her Christmas start. I mean, I cat was a complete stranger to me when she came into my studio. I her plate is up at the historical site in North Dakota, as I wanted to document to this this singer here, um, you know, this artist, this musician here in North Dakota. I thought it was important um, to hear her story, and she came in as a complete stranger, never had met her. She spent three, four hours with me in my studio, my old studio um, back in the day. And we made that portrait together and we're, I mean, we were friends of this day. So, I mean, um, but I mean, she's a perfect example of positivity and, and giving back. She's always given back and, and, and she's in the position to give back. I'm in the position to give back. And I, and I get it. Not everyone is in the position to give back. Um, but if you can, and it doesn't have to be a lot, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if you are in the position if you have that ability and you are fortunate and you have everything that you need and you're not going for want, you have to be able to identify that there are people in this world that do not have that. And if you identify that, what can you do for them? Right. I mean, is that not, I mean, that's what we're here for. That's what I think. That's what I feel I'm here for. I mean, giving back to someone, I gave my first 2000 plates away. Gave them away. Wow. 
I, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't even feel comfortable enough with my, my skill set. I mean, I would keep my favorite ones, but I mean, I would, I would gave like 90% of my work. I don't even own them. It was, it was, you know, it was my way of paying back the sitters that took time out of their lives to trust me to come in. And I just gave them the work back. So, um, it wasn't about money. Um, and, and I get it. You know what I mean? It's like, if you're, if you're so focused, on just surviving and trust me i'm not even i haven't been in this is um this is first generation um kind of wealth for my family and um you know i can remember uh, i tell the story all the time my wife loves to have me make ramen noodles for her if she asked me can you make me ramen noodles and you would think well that doesn't sound too you know what i mean too gourmet but um i when i was in california i ate ramen noodles three four times a week because i could eat i could have a meal for 12 cents um, I was actually homeless for one day in California. Um, so um, this isn't this what I've been given here. Um, it came on the back of a bunch of hard work over decades. Um, but I, I made it here and on that. You know, nobody ever gave this to me. Um, and uh, but now that I have it, uh, is it what is it all about? It sure isn't about the size of your bank account can't be can't be I love that what is life all about and you are definitely you have an amazing perspective on all of it I am just I'm speechless it's absolutely astonishing listening to you tell your story I wish more oh, well, people could I understand I'm just, I'm, just, I'm, just tell, I'm just I'm just being me I'm just you know um but you know I don't I didn't always have these perspectives this was a search and, and like you said, Steve, you know, be open to something new. Try something new. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, I've had people come in and, and they, you know, they'll come in and they, they will, they'll say to me, you know, Shane, I, I was really reluctant to come in because I don't think I'm photogenic or I didn't want to get my picture taken. I didn't want any, you know, to get attention to myself. But now that I came in, I'm just so glad that I, you know, I trusted and I, you know, I, I, I put myself out there just to do something different, right? Just to do, you know, just even come into my studio, you just, you know, just come in for a couple of hours and, and you're, you're, you're going to get to see something you've never seen before. And in that, you know, you can take, you can take things away from that. And, um, I, I have chased the bottom line. Um, and I always thought that that's what it was about. And, you know, you're a business, when you go to business school, I mean, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be a successful businessman. I mean, that's wonderful. But at some point when you become a successful businessman and you actually, you know, have more than you need, um, you can just give it back. It doesn't have to be, you know, it, it can be any, any generous, um, token towards someone else. It's, I don't know why I sound like a broken record, but it's, no, it's, it's just the way that I it's just the way that I feel. And it's not even monetary always. It's those small acts of kindness, those little ripple effects, those little things that you can pay it forward to somebody that is everyone if everyone does that all together, will all make a huge difference in this world. With those ripple yeah. effects. And you know, and yeah. you must have your passion. It must always bleed through into your family now that your daughter has gotten into the wet plate and kind of wanting to like following your footsteps, right? So she is seeing that passion. She is understanding your why and your drive. Well, you can just, I mean, all you can be is um, an example for your children. I mean, that's what you, you know, I want my, uh, my, my kids are always down here. Um, they're always down here seeing what I'm doing. And they, they know that this, this takes, a, you know, that dad's down in the studio, he's doing this work, but they, they have to see why I'm doing it. And they've got to see the big picture. And I, I hope when they get older, they understand, you know, um, what it is I was trying to accomplish here. And who knows if I'm going to accomplish what I'm, what, you know, what I'm trying to. I mean, who knows? Uh, you know, in the documentary, I say, um, I will see this through the end until, unless uh, fate breaks my stride. So, um, again, um, thinking as a, as a, a mortal, as a, as a human being, um, someone that, you know, things can happen. So um, we're only here so long. What are you going to do with it? And I think you will have a much rewarding, uh, a much better uh, life if you just figure out how to help someone else. Because we all, we all need help. We all need help. And, and like you said, it's not monetary help. It's um, it's just, you know, showing someone 
um, just trying to be there for someone or do something, just the smallest thing. If, if it's just even sending someone a print or something like that, you'd be surprised at how it brightens someone's day and, and, and they can take that positive uh a positive emotion and, and, and maybe uh, like you said it's so it's so um cliche this play the pay it forward kind of thing you know I mean, we've seen the movies and the con- it's it's not like i'm making these concepts up right i mean this isn't this isn't new but it's one thing to know about the concept but then it's another thing to try to practice the concept to actually you know to actually do it um you know actually do it, it it's not that difficult it's not that difficult no, that was something that, uh, interestingly, because I don't believe in coincidences and irony much anymore these days, but interestingly, a uh, uh, motivational um, speech from, uh, I think it was Tony Robbins earlier I was listening to, and he talked about that. And, you know, everything you've been saying, uh, uh, w- when I first opened the book, the first thing is the dedication. And, and I want to take a second just to read this and, and get your thoughts and, and some background on who uh, um, who this is from. But uh It says Shane's work shines on its artistic merit and for its collaborative nature. It is genuine and enthusiastic on a human level. For the folks of many different Indian tribes who sit for his portraits and who often become his lifelong friends, Shane builds lasting rapport. It is this rapport and the importance of the honest collaboration between people of different cultures that is so vital for our country, and it is the heart of moving this nation or moving forward as a nation. I strive to emulate the rapport that Shane has achieved in his art and the work I'm doing in Congress. Shane's photographs are not only beautiful, they convey the best example of good people working together to achieve something great. Congresswoman Deb Haaland, who I just spoke with two days ago. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) That's why I don't believe in irony anymore. (laughs) I I, I text, Deb Haaland and I text back and forth once a week. I mean, we are we are in each other's lives. I mean, she's busy. Can you about imagine um, one, one one of two first Native American congresswomen of the United States? But um, we talked this week because they are there. There's rumors, um, and the, my image of her, my portrait of her, that is um, at the historical site in North Dakota, and then there's one down. So I took that day. I took four portraits of Deb Haaland. Um, one of them went to the historical site in North Dakota, part of my series. One of them went to Arizona um, into her historic society, which was a promise of mine. One is on her wall hanging in D.C., and the one here is here with me um, in Bismarck. Um, but it, there's rumors that um, Biden is going to possibly um, select her as the um, interior, uh, the secretary of the interior. And can you imagine having a Native American as the secretary of the interior? Um I don't, I don't know what would be more poignant and more special than, 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 than having that, um, than having her be uh, selected for that position. But that's what we are talking about this week. So um, there's uh, some of the tribes are getting together and they're putting, um, they're putting lists together. People are signing petitions trying to get Deb Hallen as the as the Secretary of the Interior, a Native American woman as the Secretary of the Interior for the United States of America. Um, I don't. I don't know what to say about that. I yeah, mean, I, I could. I mean, I just that just almost brings tears to my eyes when I when I heard about it. So we had a conversation. And I, you know, I told her I hope she can do this, and she says, "Yeah, I want to do it." And she did an article out there, and that she if she gets uh, nominated or he selects her, that she obviously wants to do this job. So uh, we'll, we'll see if that happens. But it's just even the idea um, um, that that can happen is just it's just a wonderful idea uh, a female native american as the secretary of the interior for the united states of america i don't i don't know it doesn't get any better than that well yeah but deb is a, a fabulous lady absolutely fabulous lady and we, we spent you know the the documentary again goes into her visits and and um i was supposed to have like three hours to capture these four plates her plane was late and she arrived, we had the book signed in at one o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday. And she did not even get into the airport till like 1035. I picked her up at the Bismarck airport and had to rush back to the studio, which is about 10 miles away, 12 miles away, get her portraits done. I had 40 minutes to capture four portraits of, the, of, of her. And then we had to get onto the book signing. So it was this crazy day. And in the documentary, you'll see, you can feel the weight on my shoulders um, when I'm talking to Margaret about it. We just have to get the portraits. That's all that matters. The book signing, you know, she came in 
congressman in the United States on her own dime flew in from Washington, D.C. to speak at my book signing. I mean, how, when does that happen? I mean, this isn't I, this isn't her state. This is North Dakota. She had never been here before. I think she had gone to the Dakota Access Pipeline during the protest. She had been here, there briefly. But, I mean, this is, there's, she has no reason to come to Bismarck other than that she knew about my work and um, wanted to come and, and, and uh, support me. I mean, that's just, that's nonsense. It's, it's crazy. monumental. Yeah, it just shows so, how much. These are, the, these are the things. These are the things that um, come my way. Yeah, and there's, I always believe there's a reason that our, our paths, you know, intertwine. And, uh, you know, what you're doing, even though you're extremely modest about it, you're bringing a different light to a whole, a whole culture and to a whole technology, you know, things that are, uh, that are lost and some things that are modern, you know, the, the technology is a lost art. You're one of a thousand people out of, you know, a hundred bajillion people. And that means that's monumental as well. Plus, you know, the book that you've made and all of the photos that you've made, you know, it just, I, you know, I, I just, I commend you for, for what I'm, you, you're I'm, doing out there. Just getting started, Steve. I just feel like I'm just getting started, buddy. You know, and um, eight years is not a long time. No, no, it is not. You know, and you're talking about paths and how like things just seem to be working out and coming. You know, it's like you, you know, wanted to document Kat Perkins when, you know, she was like on, you know, becoming the celebrity and she's hitting it with her singing and her stuff. And Stephen, you know, randomly met her at a restaurant in Watertown, which is, you know, our main town near us here. And so it's like how those cr- those paths just cross not coincidental, not ironic. It's just the way that things are meant to be and the way that things are supposed to work out in our life and what puts us into that next step. It's like having those lofty goals or having these things. If you keep your mindset open, what could come your way? And you just take the time. You just take the time. Um, you know, I never, if anyone asks me for, you know, to do anything, if it's about, you know, the, this podcast or it's some kind of article or, They want to do this for a fundraiser or, you know what I mean? You do this, Shane. I'm always, I always answer all those inquiries. I always address all those inquiries. I always, I'm I'm very seldom saying no um, to anything. And, um, you know, just, just try to do as much as you can. Just do as much as you can. And um, it it always, it always tends to come back. It always comes back and, and, but but do it and not expect something. when, When you're not expected, that's when these wonderful little, these little the, the universe comes together and you know um i you know i uh, i don't I'm, ha- I'm having a hard time trying to articulate what i'm trying to say um but if you don't do it for a reason thinking you're going to get something back do everything that you do not expecting not to get anything back and when it comes back it's so sweet it's so sweet, and it comes back how you'd weren't, you would never have imagined it coming back anyway, and um, and you you'll just uh, I think you'll feel blessed for it. Yeah, that's something that you know when I started this, it it continues to evolve, and you know I wanted my wife to be a part of it because we talk about so many different subjects, and one she can remember a lot of stuff that I don't, and she has a different perspective than I do on the world and and different things, but we have a one common goal, and you know it continues to evolve though. You know, as you touch on uh, as well, that it just, you know, it was a, a group of a few people, a few hundred people maybe, and let's share positive stuff and help each other. And now we're over 1,600, and it's been 11 months. We've got 47 episodes. Well, it will be with this one. And it just, you know, the people that have been put into our path. And, uh, you know, it's you kind of go through lulls even with this. There's times where, well, I don't know what to post, or I'm not sure how to motivate someone or I'm having trouble motivating myself or should we schedule an episode (laughs) with somebody? It's, it's like, it's not like it's work for me to just call someone and do this, but sometimes emotionally it feels like it is, but you just keep doing it. And like you said, when some of the times those affirmations come back, it just like, it punched me right in the gut. It just, or right in my heart. Like it was like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I have someone telling me thanks. I needed that today or wanting to share their story with us or that you even listen to this podcast 
and we've had over 4,000 streams and there's some that get millions, but over 4,000 people, well, 4,000 streams in 11 months. I can't believe anybody didn't want to listen to it in the beginning. And now, now look at us, you know, that's yeah, something to be proud of, something to be proud of. And when, and when the students come out and I'm always talking about students cause it's, it's a really special, um, it's a really special part of what I do here is having the students come out to my studio and, and, you know, from the colleges, they may maybe learn about the web plating just, you know, in a book or something from the teacher, but then they get to come out and actually get to share it with them and show them analog. And, and these kids are so young, they, they don't know analog versus digital. All they know is digital. So I'm able to show them this, this, this archaic process and, and, you know, you just have to, if I have, you know, I've had as many as like 42 students in my studio at one time. Um, you just have to touch one of them. I mean, you just have to get through to one of them. And, um, you know, the, the, all the time and all the effort, it's all well worth it. You know, it's not, uh, it, 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 it can be little, it can be little games, right? It's just little games. It doesn't have to be gargantuan kind of life affirming changes. It could just be little games, uh, reaching certain people, um, and, uh, it can be so rewarding. It can be so rewarding. Yeah. I always talk about, there's a lot of self therapy and what we do. And since I, uh, um, I'm frequent with counseling and uh, personal development is something I feel compelled to, I think, continue evolving and, and helping others with it's, there's so much self therapy too. I feel when, you know, I, it, whether it's an affirmation from someone or whether someone even just reacts to one of our posts or shares it, you know, it's almost like I share in their their thoughts or in their emotions because what they when they read whatever I typed and and you know it comes from my heart because I feel compelled to say it even though I'm sharing a picture quote that someone else wrote or another page maybe posted, but when I share my thoughts on it and they share it, it's like like we're sharing in this together, this movement or this, uh, um, you know, um, we're all sharing in the journey of you know, making the world a little bit more positive, you know, and if it was one person, that's, that's amazing. Cause I wish I would have had that 10 years, 15, five years ago, you know, and, right. and, uh, so how you're doing it is a different context, but man, are you touching some lives, lots, about hundreds of thousands of them for sure. Well, I'm just, you know, you get a voice and, and, um, uh, you know, you get a voice, you get this opportunity to have a voice. And I think that's, Cat, I, I can't speak for her, but I mean, Cat, and I, you know, I'm not talking about her musical voice either. Although know, she's a beautiful singer, I'm just talking. She has a voice. People look up to her, um, and she's always trying to do the right thing. She's always trying to be positive. She's always trying to to stand up for the less fortunate. And um, you know, so so many times people are given a voice and they just don't use it properly. Um, not to judge them, but just to. You know, it's it, your own voice should not be about your own self promotion. Um, that's not the reason why, I, at least for me. Um, obviously, I have to promote myself, but um, but it's not about promoting using my voice to promote myself. It's about using my voice to stand up for others sometimes, and, and that's what I'm trying to do with my work as well, um, and trying to uh, um, raise awareness of, of different different. Um, issues for people um, um, that people may not be aware of. Yeah. And that's why, you know, one of our, our things is uh, we giving back and that's what you've talked about multiple times on this. And so we just recently put on our website, um, I guess a mission statement, if you will, and any donations we receive or any revenue we make off of gear or shirts or whatever you want to call it in the future. uh, One mission is to, at, send some people to therapy, help them at least for through two sessions, pay for those. Uh, if we're working with a special charity on an episode to, you know, do some kind of campaign to help give them back and then to help expand our reach. You know, you say you talk about um, you, you have to do the Facebook stuff. You know, we, we have a choice to thankfully be able to do it in a positive fashion, but we've got to advertise. And, you know, I just put that in the mission statement because I think the more we expand, the more we can touch other people's lives and inspire them. And that's why bringing attention to your work, whether we have one listener off this episode or we have 1 million listeners, you know, sending them to your work. And when I read through that book, uh, there was times that 
I, I felt emotional. You know, I felt this travel back through time um, in a sense of, of what it must have been like. Um, you know, I like to watch older, you know, TV shows, if, like a period show, I think they call them, where they're set mm-hmm. back in time. And, you know, just mm-hmm. picture, in me, it's a gratitude thing, but gosh, think of what it must have been like to to live like that uh, and, and how e- nice we do have it today. But, God, you put such a different spin on, you know, that kind of... Uh, bringing me back, you know, and, and how you're giving back. You just really, um, you really touch my, my soul, I think, with, with what you're doing. Well, I, I think it's about the human condition, right? Um, the human condition that we're all in this together. We're all, we all come in, we all go out. Um, the, the, these are inevitable facts. And um, the human condition, um, you know, to be, to be able to document um, some particular people, um, during my time here, uh, you know, um, and I, you know, to leave some kind of record behind it, it's, I don't, I don't know why, um, I hope it's not a vanity thing. Um, but I, I want to leave something behind that shows, uh, says, you know, that we were here, not just, just not me, but everyone who sat for me, that we are here. This is who we were. This is who, you know, who we are. Um, and, and some proof of our existence, um, I, I don't that for me that's what it's all about um some kind of document and there, there's no finer document on this planet than no. a website clothing and photograph and i don't find that vanity at all hmm. no nope. i hope not but you know no there's no um, way that you can interpret this episode and when people go to and we'll we'll enter what we call the shameless plug zone after a bit and talk about how to look at all your, your things and check you out. But, um, one thing that I can say for sure, I've said the word modesty and, and humbleness. I don't know how many times, but you have a certain passion, um, that comes out of when you talk about this and, and vanity is the, the, the last thing that I would think of in this. And, you know, I'm inspired, um, on so many different levels, you know, with something like this. So, um, I can't wait well, I to appreciate it. To get I appreciate there. it. I'm, I appreciate it. I'm just, I'm just doing me. Um, <laughs> the only, the only way I know how, you know. Yeah, you once you, uh, you get your thousand um, um, wet plates done, then you can do a follow up documentary, and you call just doing me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people ask me, are you, are you, are you really going to stop at a thousand? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, I just had to throw some stupid number out there to kind of, you know, like let's really challenge ourselves. But, you know, I knew if I said a thousand, I just, I knew what I was in for. Um, I knew what I was, you know, um, the goal that I was setting was, was huge. And, um, but there's something about that, you know, I just, you know, on other things like um, the, 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 we went in into the pandemic, we went into lockdown in March, uh, March 15th, my family and I, when we, you know, when we were all first locked down and, uh, I have not, uh, you know, uh, talk about positive things as well. Um, I have not, I've run every day since March 16th of this year, um, three miles a day. So yesterday um, I was at, I want to say 700 and some miles I've run. Um, I have not missed a day since March, March 16th I've run. And my goal is to run, um, run three miles a day for an entire year. That'll take me well over a thousand miles. And um, when uh, I get to that day, I want to take the day off of work. I'm going to do like a little, um, carry my phone with me on my run and do a video as I'm running and talk about, you know, what this last year of running. I, I think at first I was running from the pandemic, um, cause I, I really didn't know what, what was coming. And, um, but as a positive thing is that, you know, fitness and, and taking care of your body is also very important. Um, and I've been running, um, you know, I'm, I'm approaching probably Chicago now, um, for the, three miles a day. Um, it doesn't, three miles doesn't seem like a lot. Um, but if you have to do it every day, no matter how you're feeling, uh, it's, uh, it is a daunting task for someone who's 51 years of age, but here I find myself, you know, um, three, you know, two thirds of the way through. And I, I can't wait to get to March 15th and, and make, and, and get to that goal and, and to, uh, and to put this down that I ran three miles a day for an entire year running. Wow. Well, and it's going to be pretty damn hard here. Come up in a couple few months when it's maybe thirty below up there, and that's something a lot of people. Boy, I'll I'll just go on the treadmill. Oh, okay. I'm not crazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not crazy. 
but yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's something that's, uh, and I don't, you know, why I, why I did that, you know what I mean? We were talking about the thousand plates and then why am I, why am I pushing myself physically? So during all of this, I'm pushing myself physically, um, you know, your feet ache and your knees ache or your back aches. I mean, there's just days that you just don't want to put the shoes on. And I'm just, no matter what happens on that day, I am finding my 30 minutes and running my three miles come hell or high water. And I don't have no idea what's pushing me to do this, but, um, um, you know, it's my little Everest, my little physical Everest at 51 years of age to, to do this. And I'm going to, I'm just one step at a time, but it, you know, it goes back to my wet plate creative life too, my journey. You know what I mean? It's the same thing. One step at a time, just one step at a time. So when that, you know, a couple months ago, a young uh, wet plate a clothing photographer called me up and wanted to wanted to know my secret. He called it of uh, well, how I become so successful at this. And I'm like, I didn't have an answer for him. I, you know, I said, kindness, kindness, do something for someone else. That's always what I've done. So, you know, but it's not, it, it's not, it's not that secret where you just push a button and it happens, you know, it's, it's the long arduous journey, just similar to like this running that I'm doing right now. I mean, why am I pushing myself to do this? I have, I don't have an answer for that. I just, I started running. I put it in my mind that I was going to do it. And I just, I'm just continuing to do it no matter what. And that, and that's how I do my, my work here too. And my, my photography is that I'm just continuing to one plate at a time. Amazing, Shane. You are an amazing individual, a human being, an amazing human being. Oh, you guys are generous. And I am so excited. I cannot wait to come up to Bismarck and meet you in person. Yeah, you guys, it'll, you'll come out on a, on a Friday. Um, I start around 11 a.m. because we, we, we're, kind of, um, we're kind of at the God's mercy with the sun and stuff. So we're usually the best times in the studio from like 11 a.m. to like 4 p.m. By 4 o'clock, the sun starts setting. So we're, we use the, the light as, uh, uh, as, as, we, uh, as, as we need it. Can I tell you a couple of interesting facts about wet plate photography real quick? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I already told you that the plates are completely archival, correct? That they'll be here a thousand years from now. Mm -hmm. And the example that I use is if you put a silver spoon on the ground and come back 500 years, what's on the ground? And the answer is a silver spoon. So these images will outlast any pigments or dyes or paints or anything else that we've ever done. Um, the other thing about wet plate photography for, uh, for your listeners is that these are some of the most high resolution images man has ever made. I'm actually writing in molecules of silver so a molecule of silver at the tip of your finger, you can't visualize it, right? It's, it's at the microscopic level. It takes 2 billion molecules of silver for the human eye to actually be able to visualize the, the uh, molecule of silver, 2 billion of them together, clumped together, to be able to see it with the, na with the naked eye. Well, my images are written in these molecules of silver. So you can take any one of my wet plates and take it to any microscope at any university and put it underneath that microscope and you can't get to the pixel of grain that makes up the image. So these are the most high resolution photographs man has ever made. Some of them. You need an electron microscope to get to the pixel of grain that makes it up. Wow. Other beautiful thing about the silver, do you know, uh, is silver um, native to earth? Mm, I don't know. Silver, the heavy metal. Is it native to earth? I would, no. You're, you would be correct. Okay, I, yeah. And I, I'm taking, I'm taking you as a, that was a guess. Yes, it was. <laughs> Here's a fascinating thing. I just want to throw some fun things out there for you guys. Um, so all the heavy metals, the nickels, the platinum, the the irons, the the silvers, the golds, all the heavy metals. None of them. There was never enough energy in the formation of Earth to create any of those elements. So if those weren't created here on Earth. They only got here one way, from extraterrestrial bodies slamming into Earth and, de and, and depositing the debris. So that's why you have gold mines in, in California and up in Alaska, because meteors or comets hit the Earth and spread these heavy metals. The only place that heavy metals are made is in uh, the explosion of a star. A supernova will explode, and that is enough energy to make these heavy metals. So that explosion casts these heavy metals throughout the the universe these extraterrestrial bodies will go fly through this debris and bring it and slam into earth and give us that's why we can't make gold here on earth i mean you know it's valuable right i mean if we could make gold we'd make it we don't have enough energy on earth to make gold so think about all these images that you see of mine 
all those images are made out of stardust that we brought here on a comet or a meteorite to Earth. Holy shit, Shane, you're making tiny miracles. What's Here's the-, the other thing. It's a, fo- a photon of light. You know, a photon of light, I mean, how we see everything, how we perceive everything, mm-hmm. through, you know, with our eyes, photon of light. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how long does a photon of uh, light, how long does it take to be generated in the in the sun? I couldn't even try to fake guess that, that answer. <laughs> a million years. A million years. Oh, my gosh. So a photon of light is generated in the in the core of the of the sun and the nuclear reactor of the sun and it'll travel around and bounces up and around bounces around bounces around for a million years it bounces around in the sun and then for whatever reason boom it'll leave the sun's uh it'll leave the sun's surface and travel eight minutes to earth it'll bounce off my sitter's face it'll be reflected back onto the ground glass and will activate photosensitive silver making these images so we're using million year old photons of light to make these images in pure silver on glass that will be here for thousands of years just when i didn't think that you could explain that any more beautifully um saying something like that just blows your mind even further yeah that was a mind yeah, explosion you you don't have you don't you know you you have to reflect you have to reflect on things you have to ask the questions right ask the questions if you ask the questions and you do the research and you and you and you fall down a rabbit hole and that's what I've done I've fallen down this rabbit hole and there's and I'm I'm you know there's no end I'm I'm sitting here halfway down and I'm still looking down there's still more to go and I'm just going to continue to follow this until wherever it ends up taking me but it's uh, you know it's these these chances with the students and I when they come in I try to make these uh, an experience like and even anyone who comes in when you guys come in. in have your portraits taken that day i'll have other sitters and you guys will hang out we'll create together and then i'll do your guys' portrait it, it needs to, you know it's an experience and and i think that experience and that that camaraderie and that that um that togetherness that we spend in my studio it transfers to the plate and the people that see these images and if they like them they're seeing that but they just don't understand why they think you know why the image i i a lot of people they don't understand why they like the image but I think it's, this is this is me again being romantic. I think it's all these layers of what it took to get the image, and all these little elements coming together. I've always said that the the, the wet plate process is imperfect. I mean, when you come in and you see it, you'll see that there's. I mean, it does it does its things, and you got to pay attention completely, or you don't get an image. So it's an imperfect system, right? It's an imperfect process. My sitter, the person that sits in my chair. They're imperfect. They're a human being, right? They're fallible. They, they're, they've got, uh, they, they have issues. We're, we're all imperfect, right? The, the, the cameraman, me, I'm imperfect. They're, I mean, you know, I'm not, there's nothing perfect about me. I'm not, I'm not the best photographer on the planet, not even close. But when you have all these imperfect things coming together, the process, the sitter, the photographer, all these imperfect things come together, guess what? You get something rather perfect. I'm, it just makes me speechless. It really does. The way that you you engage thoughts, and that's one of we say that in every outro of our podcast. That um, we also want to just have episodes that engage your thoughts, and so much of what you're talking about can be put into you know. I continue keep saying this. I'm a broken record tonight, but um, personal development, and that was another um, little episode I listened to the other day. And it was you. You have to ask the questions. You know, you got to find out what's your focus in life, and and is it a positive focus, and and how are you going to change? You know, what you want to. You know, sometimes it's how you ask the question. You know, like I'm going to go on a diet, or you know, what if you said I'm going to change my life and eat this way for the rest of my life because I want to be happy, because I want to be more productive, I want to be able to hang out with my kids and grandkids, and. You know, it paints a picture when you ask the question the right way. And so when you said that statement, that's, <laughs> that just floated through my head again. So you've touched on so many different levels today. Hmm. Well, thanks. I, I'm, I'm glad you guys have me on the show. It's, it, it's an honor. It really is. And, and you know, it's, it's one thing to, to get, you know, on shows that are, you know, around the world or something like that or podcasts. I've done with something from the UK and stuff like that. But it's another thing to have a local um, you know, when I'm on local news or I'm on, you know, your guys' podcast is local or a local archive, like when the uh, um, Plains Art Museum took some of my place a couple weeks ago, 
um, there's something very special about when it, it, it's lo- local because this is, um, you know, this is where I grew up. I mean, um, you know, went to Bismarck High School. Um, this is where I'm from. So, uh, and I raised my, you know, I chose to, to come back from California to raise my family here. I've got four children, a beautiful wife, and we've been uh, married for nearly 20 years. And, um, you know, these were all decisions that I had made to, you know, give up what I thought what I was doing in California was so important, you know, um, in the business world. And then I came back here and didn't know what I was going to do. And then how does a businessman become an oncology nurse? And, and um, you know, and then to become uh, a businessman and then, then to become an artist, I mean, that's one thing that people can take away from my little story. And I just gave a talk out at the university of Mary a couple of weeks ago. Um, but that's one thing that you can take away from my story is that, you know, the, the journey is never over. You know what I mean? It's not like, Oh, you get that job and that's it. You know what I mean? You're going to do this for the rest of your life. And then, and then that's it. It doesn't need to be that way. You can, you can always reinvent. Look at how many times I've reinvented myself. Uh, but you know, fifty yeah, years really of age mean. and all the all these all these reinventions of myself, all these things that I've done, um, these, these are all different things. A businessman and a college nurse. I mean, I, I, I will go back to Bismarck State College I mean, in business school, which I had previously. I got my degree in at college from California in business. I mean, there's no science whatsoever in that pursuit. And I come back. Um, my grandfather has a stroke. Um, and it goes up to St. Vincent's and I, I came back from California and I was, I, I felt like I was kind of depressed at the time. Um, and so I would go up and spend time with my grandfather in the afternoons. I'd go and spend 15 minutes with him. And then my 15 minutes became a half hour, became an hour. And the next thing you know, the, the nuns and the nurses were asking me, well, can you walk this person or can you play checkers with this person or can you sit with this person? Um, and then the, uh, then one night I'm, I'm trying try to get to the story of how I became a nurse. Um, one night, one of the, the nurses from the nurse's station walked up to me and said, um, Shane, we have a, a resident that, um, is passing away tonight. We're so busy on the floor. We're afraid that she may pass away, um, without anyone being in the room. Would you sit with her? Um, so I volunteered for that, um, that honor and, um, I sat with her. And, um, she passed away and I was holding her hand when she passed away. And, uh, it was after that shift, I was, you know, it was like five o'clock, six o'clock in the morning. I got out of there like seven o'clock. It was all volunteer, by the way, I wasn't getting paid. Um, and I drove by the school of nursing, uh, medicine and one school of nursing. And I pulled over and I walked in and asked to see the Dean. The Dean says, I'm in here. And I walked in and sat down and he, uh, we talked for an hour and, um, I was on my way to become a nurse. Um, so that's how a businessman becomes a nurse. But I, I guess the story is, is that, you know, just be open to things. And um, I've always been open and, you, and you're never stuck. Don't ever feel stuck. If you don't like where you're at or what you're doing, um, just change it. Try something different. I don't have all the answers. I mean, this hasn't been perfect. Um, but, uh, you know, I've always been willing to change. And, and that's how I've been able to reinvent my myself. And, and, and now as an artist, I'm just sick. I, I, I was meant to do this. This is what I was always meant to do. I just took a long path around it, but it was being open and, and um, available to different different ideas um, that, that got me to where I'm at today. And all of those things you went through and all those different paths you took led you to where you are today. They helped you to probably find your passion. They helped you to inspire these because life is not, like you said, it's not just going to happen to you. You have to go after it. And you can't always like look back. It's all about, okay, now where's this next path going to take me? Because it's not accidental that you go through things like this. Yeah. And and with the nursing, I mean, you have to think that me chasing nursing, I mean, I was trying to give back, right? I mean, they, they would give me a pager. And when someone was not doing so well at the, at the, um, at the nursing home, they would page me and I'd go and sit with them. Just, just so they weren't alone. And I didn't know anything about nursing. I knew how to hold a hand and I knew to put a, how to put a cold washcloth to their forehead. And the, me doing that and, and that volunteering up there got me out of that rut that I felt I was in coming back from Cal- you know, California, didn't know what I was doing, and got me on this path of trying to help other people. It was, it was um, you know, and then, and then it just made sense when I graduated. So I had to go up to BSC again. Uh, and, and get a degree. And then I had to go to the, you know, I got my four year degree in nursing eventually. 
Uh, but then I knew where I was going to go. I was going to oncology. I was going where every day, every patient on that floor needed me. I mean, there's other floors, you know what I mean? Um, that it's not as dire or um, circumstances aren't as high. As, I mean, they don't get any higher than on oncology. And with the death and dying, and I heard he had experience um, with the death and dying issues, uh, you know, up at the at the nursing home. So it just, it's the only place. I graduated on a Friday. I was day one, Monday, on the oncology floor at Med Center One. I had 13 patients. I had never been a nurse on the floor. I mean, I never had, I mean, I'd never CNA. I had no experience, practical experience whatsoever being a nurse other than my, you know, my studies and my clinical rotations and stuff at the college. And here I was um, taking care of 13 oncology patients the first day of work. Wow. You're, you're, I, did that, I did that for five years. Your passion for compassion is is immense and if the the world had a quarter or a half of of your passion f- to have compassion for the other human beings out there i think the world would be in a hell of a lot better situation than it is you know right now so um you are and continue to be and will always be an inspiration no thanks i appreciate it well i cert- i really mean it because this is uh one of the one of the best interviews we've had um, up to date, and uh, all of them have been special in their own right. But um, I've been um, inspired and enthralled, and and motivated, and my engaging my thoughts. It's just been I'd like to have one of those uh, uh, brain analyst things hooked up to my head to see how <laughs> how my brain was flying <laughs> around throughout this whole episode because it's just been been amazing, and I can't thank you enough. Well, we won't. So we won't let tonight be, um, you know, our only time together. So I, I, I made the offer to you and the wife to come out. So you guys just have to let me know what Friday that you can uh, come into into Bismarck, and uh, you'll come in, and we will we'll spend the whole afternoon together, and we'll be creating. I'll have other sitters and stuff, and you'll get to see me do my thing, and I'll, I'll do the whole. I'll run through the whole process with you, and and um, I, I think um, I think we'll have a good day together. So. I can't wait. I'm so excited. So, um, I look forward to it. Thank you. Is, uh, well, is there anything that you think that, uh, we missed that you want to get out there or do you want to enter the shameless plug zone and tell us how to find you and, uh, learn about you and all that, that good stuff? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, uh, the documentary bulk, which again, my last name is on Amazon prime. Um, if, People want to find me on Facebook. I'm Shane Balkwich on Facebook. I also run a um, a web plate group called Friends of Frederick Scott Archer, the guy who invented it. So it's called Friends of Frederick Scott Archer. If you're interested in web plate photography, um, when I started uh, web plate photography here in North Dakota, I was the only one, and now there's five of us uh, in North Dakota, and we are we're forming a little group. And we're we're doing um, we're doing putting some words down, formal words about what we're doing here in, in this time and era together creating in this process. We're going to get a little logo and it's, it's going to be really kind of kind of cool. So um, so, you know, if people are interested in wet plate photography, they can go out to Friends of Frederick Scott Archer, um, which is my group. And then if um, I'm on Instagram as Shane as, as in Balkowicz, Shane Balkowicz as well. And if people want to learn more about me, find my website and stuff. Instead of me just giving you one particular website, if you just go to Google and type in Balkowicz wet plate, two words, um, wet and plate separated, um, you're going to get all the articles um, that have been written about me. And you, there's, um, I've done TEDx talks and, and other podcasts and, and things like that. So, and then you can look at uh, some of my photography and if anyone's interested in, in coming out and wanting to see more, I, I have an open door policy on my Friday. You never know who may just be showing up. So um, just uh, have someone, you know, your listeners can just message me if they're interested and, and then I will, I'll look at the calendar. We'll figure something out and they can come in and spend the afternoon if they want in my studio and I'll show them what this is all about. Because it, for me, it's all about the sharing of, um, of this process about keeping it alive and, and letting people know that it's, it's still a viable uh, form of art. And, um, you know, there's a small group of us that are still trying to keep this alive. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, you can find me on uh, Facebook uh, and uh, Google and stuff like that. So amazing. You were absolutely amazing. And I can't thank you enough. Catherine, do you have some thoughts on everything? I just feel very blessed to have been able to have this conversation with you and so honored that you would welcome us into your studio. Of course. Yeah, we will. Um, 
uh, maybe we can do uh, a little recording here or something on that day too or something like that. That'd be kind of fun. Maybe on 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 set or something like that. That may be fun in the <laughs> studio. But, yeah, um, we'll we'll uh, we'll it'll be a good day. Whatever. I just you know, get to uh, meet you guys for the first time because we've never met before. Getting to meet you and show you this process that I've been talking to you about. Um, it'll be rewarding. So and then I'll do a, I'll do a portrait for your family. So it'll be a. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll document some history here as well, okay? Well, in the good Dakota language, oofta. I can't believe that <laughs> that we even get to, we get that opportunity. So uh, I will, we'll be getting a hold of you very soon, I think. <laughs> my, my pleasure, you guys. My pleasure. Okay, well, thank you very much, Shane. Um, we appreciate um, the time that you gave us. And, uh, um, you know, we'll, uh, I'll get you a copy of this right away. So um, as soon as we're done, we can... Um, you can do what you need to with that, and then um, yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, it'll come out this That'd next be... Wednesday, so we'll share yeah, it with you the world. Share the share the link with me or whatever. I mean, um, you can just reach me at like Shane at dot com my email, and you can I don't know if we transfer whatever you want to do. I'll make sure yep. that it's documented properly and labeled properly, so when it gets up there, um, people know exactly who uh, who is responsible for it. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's what we use as the we transfer. So I'll. Uh, um, I'll finish it up tonight yeah, and get yeah, it to no you. Pro- yeah, no, no problem. So I, I hope I was able to give uh, your listeners something um, different, um, uh, hopefully. Absolutely. Well, have a great evening, Shane. And thank you okay. for your family as well for allowing you to share your time with us. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell them thanks when I get up to the house, okay? Yep. Perfect. Thanks, Shane. Okay, you guys sleep well. We'll talk to you soon. You too. Thank you. Okay, bye. Yeah, bye. Well, holy smokes. I know. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure what to say about that. Um, it's one of our, our longer episodes, which uh, just tells you how enthralled that we were because I didn't, I I guess I kind of did reel it in, but we, we probably could have talked, I bet, for a very long time. He is an absolute outstanding individual. You all need to check it out. Again, Shane's last name, Balkowicz is B-A-L-K-O-W-I-T-S-C. H. Yep. So, and uh, I, I, I do have a dream of trying to make our Positively Midwest podcasts and uh, everything that we do in experience. So I love that he said that because that's what I'd love to do is make that, um, that visit and that portrait and so on an experience. So yeah. any closing thoughts? I don't think so. He is absolutely, I'm touched. I am so touched. Yeah. He resonates with a lot of the things that we talk about in so many different ways. <clears throat> yeah. So, sorry I cut you off and you said absolutely because <laughs> I had to clear my throat. Okay, well, should we close this bad boy? Yes, Mr. Durance. Okay, here we go. Thank you all from the bottom of our hearts for listening to the Positively Midwest podcast. Our hope is to inspire, engage each other's thoughts, and to leave you with some great advice. Be sure to join our Facebook group and follow us on Instagram at Positively Midwest Podcast. Make sure you like, comment, share, and screenshot our podcast with all your cool friends. Every little bit helps. We are on most all major platforms, and you can stream it on our website at PositivelyMidwest.com. Thank you, and as always, please always stay positive.